Good evening. Um, thank you very much. It is an uh, enormous uh, uh, honor and privilege to be here with you. Um, ambassadors, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. Um, two years ago, uh, I, I was asked uh, by a senior British Treasury official <clears throat> when I was uh, doing nothing in my life, we have an uh, important project we want you to lead on. Uh, and he said, uh, I said, what is it? And he said, it's to chair a review into AMR. And I said, what is AMR? <clears throat> Two years ago, uh, I had no idea what antimicrobial resistance was. Some people uh, may still think I don't, um, but I have just, uh, uh, with my team, uh, come to the end of our life as an independent review, and last Thursday we published uh, our final recommendations uh, as to what we think needs to happen uh, to put this scourge and enormous risk behind us. I'm going to, I know I am uh, speaking, I am what's separating you from dinner, so I shall try to be very brief, and I'm going to show you a few slides that hopefully you can see uh, for no more than 15 minutes uh, to give you a flavor, a flavor of where, what our most important recommendations are. And I must thank Unitaid in particular and Lelio and his team for uh, your wonderful support. And we are looking forward actually to sitting down with Lelio and some of his colleagues and others of you here uh, about actually practical implementations of some of the things that we are talking about. I, I cannot resist uh, in also saying in the enormous amount of media coverage of our paper on Thursday, uh, one that stands out as being particularly uh, important, uh, and I encourage you all to read it, comes from the Lancet Health Journal, uh, which in a, a brief two-page discussion in their last paragraph, they say, <clears throat> if the UK government can now succeed in persuading the G20 as well as the United Nations to implement what the O'Neill Review has recommended, this will be the most important thing for mankind and economic development uh, in the 21st century. No pressure. So, I was asked to do this because I am an economist, uh, and it was put to me that inside the medical health world, many of you, if not all of you, this issue has been known about for a long time. But as soon as you go outside of this room, very few people know about it. And it was suggested to me that unless it is translated into economic and financial terms, we cannot get a solution. So I have approached this as uh, an economist, and most of our ideas are thought of in economic and financial terms. And as I say, I'm going to give you a very quick flavor. So the first thing we did <clears throat> uh, was try to present what will happen if we do not do anything. Uh, many of you probably know that uh, imprinted on my forehead is being Mr. Bricks. Uh, nearly 16 years ago, I had the good fortune of dreaming up this acronym to describe the likely future rise of these emerging powers. And it became famous partly because we predicted that by 2050, those large populated emerging countries would become bigger than the G7. So what we decided to do was to do another version of that, both with AMR as a problem, but with AMR not a problem. And we looked at the difference for the world between those two numbers. And what you see here, rather, can everybody see at the back, by the way? Can you see clearly? I see a hand waving, that's good. Um, rather scarily, if we don't do something about antimicrobial resistance, in another 35 years, there could be 10 million, 
10 million people a year dying. All over the world, both developed and developing. And as we highlight, probably more people than are dying of cancer today. <clears throat> Second thing we showed, directly in terms of economics and finance, how much will that cost the world economy? And this shows you that the accumulated cost over the next 35 years would be a staggering $100 trillion. So the cost of not doing anything, $100 trillion. The world economy today is somewhere between 70 to 80. And by the normal underlying uh, aspects of productivity growth and population growth, we grow by about 3.5% on average. So the world should be about three times bigger in another 35 years than it is today. But it will be $100 trillion less if we don't find a solution. <clears throat> Once we did that, we looked at all the different issues as to why this is such a problem. And we discovered 10 separate issues that sort of became our mantra as to how to solve this problem. You probably cannot see these. Public awareness, antibiotics in agriculture and the environment, surveillance, human capital, not enough researchers, no innovation, so we recommended a global innovation fund. Sanitation and hygiene. Vaccines and the role of so-called alternative therapies. Rapid diagnostics, new drugs, and linked to what I said about the Lancet, an international call for action. And our review has spent nearly two years focusing on all of these issues. I'm now going to give you a very quick flavor of the four most important things that we think we are recommending. On the last couple of pages of our paper, there is a total of 29 specific recommendations, of which four I want to highlight. <clears throat> um, three of them are what I would call demand-reducing interventions, and one of them is a supply boosting intervention, that is, new drugs. So on the demand side, here's the first one. We need state-of-the-art diagnostics. I sometimes call it Google for doctors. This slide shows you uh, some research that we uh, came across from the US that suggested perhaps nearly about one half of all antibiotics prescribed are not necessary. There has been another article just in the past fortnight uh, highlighted in the Washington Post saying something very similar. <clears throat> we all walk around with these things dominating our lives and yet when it comes to antibiotics we still use the same process that we've done since I, before I was born. In our opinion by introducing state-of-the-art diagnostics, we could dramatically reduce uh, the inappropriate use of antibiotics. So we have made a series of interventions of our 29 that relate directly to this. We want to create a much bigger market where the greatest technological innovators want to produce rapid diagnostic tests. And these are the summary of the ideas we specifically suggest. The most bold one is in Western countries, we are recommending that it becomes mandatory in Western countries, not all countries, because obviously much of the emerging world still needs to develop better health systems, but in the most developed world by 2020 to make it mandatory to not allow antibiotics to be prescribed without state-of-the-art surveillance or diagnostics where they are available. 
which of course is only four and a half years away from today. Actually, probably less. But by doing so, we think if policymakers would agree to this, it would dramatically grow the market for effective, affordable diagnostics. And we also suggest, importantly for the emerging world, along with our solution for new drugs, for diagnostics to be uh, rewarded for those that are most crucial to the so-called emerging world. And here, uh, some of our conversations with the wisdom of UNITAID uh, have influenced uh, how we are thinking about these issues. Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying because I can't move forward my slides. Here we go. Second thing is in agriculture. There is some evidence that we have been persuaded by, we've studied lots, that about 70% of the antibiotics used in the United States are actually for animals. It was very interesting when I started this role, given my previous life, I know many people from the United States, and the contrast between what people said to me from the US and from Europe was striking. Most people in the US think that this is a huge problem in agriculture. <clears throat> So, we devoted a lot of specific time to that. And so, we are recommending, staged by uh, a 10-year period starting in 2018, that there should be targets for every country in the United Nations to reduce the use of antibiotics. And to supplement that, we are also recommending that certain so-called last-in-line antibiotics, the remarkably worrying Colistin example from China, we believe that such antibiotics should be banned in the use in agriculture. We cannot have a world where antibiotics that we need of last-in-line for people are being wasted unnecessarily in agriculture. And then very importantly, as part of that, we are also suggesting a huge role to increase the role of vaccines at the expense uh, of antibiotics in agriculture. And here we've been uh, greatly influenced by the wonderful uh, groundbreaking work of Gavi. <clears throat> Third recommendation very quickly is that in addition to those two, we believe there is a need for a global public awareness campaign. Remember I said two years ago, I myself did not know what AMR was. One month ago, I spoke uh, at the big conference of something called Wired Health UK, an audience of 500 of the most technologically sophisticated health people you can find. I asked them at the start, how many of you have never heard of AMR? One third of the hands of that highly educated audience raised their hands. Can you imagine if you live in a slum in the middle of Delhi or Mumbai or on a favela in Brazil, you are not gonna have a clue what antimicrobial resistance is. And we are recommending uh, that the United Nations needs to embrace uh, a global public awareness campaign and using the evidence from similar such campaigns elsewhere uh, to help along with these other interventions. And then fourthly, linked to what I said, there are three of our recommendations for reducing the demand. The fourth one I want to highlight is of course, how do you get more drugs? shifting the supply curve, as economists would say, to the right. So we have, in essence, uh, two recommended interventions that link closely together. One is we have already, and embraced it in our final report, recommended a need for a new global innovation fund. And I am very pleased that during the process, the British and Chinese governments jointly announced 
some money committed to this during the remarkably fruitful and successful trip of President Xi's to the UK last year. And this is something that we think is vital for encouraging much more uh, academic and early stage research in antimicrobial resistance. It is staggering as to how few people actually research on AMR. In addition, and one of the interventions, not surprisingly, getting a lot of attention in the media from the pharmaceutical companies, is that we have proposed uh, something that we are calling a market entry reward that would give possibly as much as $1.5 billion to the successful, I emphasize successful, producer of the right desired needed new drug so long as that producer agreed to very clearly uh, agreed criteria for controlling distribution much less than they otherwise would do and to make sure that it is affordable across the emerging world. And here again, we are looking forward to talking with our friends from Unitaid about how exactly is the right way for that to be implemented. Crucially, and the reason why it's getting so much attention in the media, is there are a number of ways of that money could be found. And one of them could be what we are calling so-called pay or play. A $1.6 billion market entry reward is actually a significant amount of money for what at the moment is a very small market on average every year for the patented antibiotics, about one third of the existing market. And we believe it is right that under whether the governments choose to use existing health systems is one option, but we believe it is right for policymakers to consider what we are calling so-called pay or play. So for those pharmaceutical companies that want to play and produce new, effective, affordable, and controllable antibiotics, they get the reward. Those that choose to not play will possibly be the ones that collectively have to pay. Not surprisingly, some of our friends in the pharmaceutical world are not completely crazy about this idea. But we believe it is in their enlightened self-interest and their own commercial interests that we need new antibiotics. Because as all of you know, they will not be able to undertake many of the treatments that are needed for things like cancer surgery if we don't get more effective antibiotics. <clears throat> we published all of these findings last Thursday. What happens now? I said to you, I quoted to you at the start, uh, these very interesting comments from Lancet. What happens next, hopefully, is the following. September of this year, we have the remarkably key historic moment that China is chairing for the first time a G20 meeting. In my judgment, and linking to my old world, one of the very few good things to come out of the 2008 financial crisis was the G20, because it is now a pretty legitimate body for the largest countries in the world. We are hopeful that the G20 will have an agreement particularly about how to get new drugs and how to pay for them. The second big thing is the United Nations, where we are hopeful that there could be, with many people's help here, as well as on the G20, by the way, a so-called high-level agreement at the United Nations for other aspects uh, of our recommendations. And even though the independent review will come to an end, I personally, with some members of my small team, 
will be able, because I am a minister in the British Treasury, hopefully to play some role uh, in bringing these two things about together. So that is a very uh, quick summary. Thank you very much for giving me 15 minutes to do this. I hope I haven't stopped you uh, too long from enjoying your dinner. Please enjoy your evenings and help us solve antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. <laughs>